Hello, everybody, and welcome today. I appreciate you guys taking the time to join us. My name is Chad Sanderson. I'm going to be leading you guys through this uh, 45 minutes as we talk about uh, prospecting effectiveness. I see a lot of people from around the globe. Um, oh, and we're going to try something new today. I'm going to share my webcam so you guys can actually see me. Uh, I appreciate, uh, apologize if there's a glare off my uh, bald head. Let me hit this button. Um, so we're going to go through, talk about prospecting today. I want to start with a little poll, uh, and I want to ask everybody to answer this question. What is your favorite part of sales? Um, and be honest, um, <laughs> this is not a trick question. Uh, I just want to get a sense for you know, those of us that are sales professionals that spend our lives doing this every day. What is it that uh, you know, we enjoy the most about the job? Um, and don't select prospecting just because that's the topic of the day. I uh, want everybody to be uh, honest. Let's see here. Give it a couple more seconds. All right, I'm going to close that. Let's share the results. So I, hopefully nobody is surprised that uh, emailing, well, nobody likes emailing, but prospecting falls down towards the bottom of the list, right? Closing the deal is the fun part. We all, you know, love the uh, commission checks. We love the, uh, you know, the chance to help customers. Uh, solve their problems. So it's really no surprise that you know prospecting is not uh, at the top of the list for things that we like to do. Um, however, it is the lifeblood of it is the lifeblood of what sales is all about. Um, and so when we think about prospecting, sorry, webcams in the way. Uh, when we think about prospecting, it is the lifeblood of what we do. It is the way that we get the deals. It's the way we talk to customers. It's the way we make the money. Um, and so when we think about what we want to accomplish today, our goal here is really to get an overview of effective prospecting approaches and methods, right? Uh, we want to create and talk about what it means to create a, a proven and repeatable prospecting cadence. Uh, there is a way to do this. Uh, there is a way to be effective at it. Uh, there is a way to take some of the fear out of it. Uh, we're going to talk about tools and tactics for developing relationships because at the end of the day, sales is all about relationships. People buy from people, people they trust most importantly. Um, we're going to talk about value-based interruptions. So how do you engage with people that you don't know in a, in a way that is valuable to them, the key is to them, not you, uh, and why that approach is so effective. We'll talk about how to do this at scale, right? So everybody... Uh, I've never met an executive who said, you know, my team has too many leads, uh, and I haven't met a sales rep who says that. So what we want to do is be able to come up with something that's proven and repeatable, and that we can do at scale as well. And then, of course, if you can't measure it, it didn't happen. So we want to talk about measuring, you know, your progress as you're filling the funnel. Um, so at, at, the, at the end of the day, who should really care about prospecting? Well, the fact of the matter is that anybody in sales should care, right? It isn't. It doesn't matter if you're a market-based sales team. Doesn't matter if you're an account-based sales team. Doesn't matter if you're an SDR, BDR account manager. Doesn't matter. Uh, everybody who's in sales has to be prospecting, right? At the end of the day, we want uh, we want the results, right? We have to have those leads. Now, some people are lucky enough to have SDRs or to have marketing and inbound leads. Um, I have yet to meet a sales professional who says uh, that marketing gives them all the leads they need to exceed their quota, right? So when we talk about you know, looking at prospecting, it is what we, is what we do, and everybody in sales, you know, has to be doing it. Um, so let's get some myths out of the way, right? Salespeople, myself included, are always looking for a silver bullet. We're always looking for the best and best way to do something. If there's an easier way to do it, especially when it comes to prospecting, we're gonna we're gonna try it, right? But the fact of the matter is that no matter what technology comes out, what new trend hits the market, there is no silver bullet for prospecting. Never has been never will be. And the other thing that a lot of people debate is cold calling. Cold calling's dead, it doesn't work, nobody answers the phone. That's not true uh, by a long shot. We'll talk about some specific stats around that as we go through the presentation today. We'll touch on social selling. Um, there are a lot of people that want to tell you that social selling is a silver bullet and it's not. It is a phenomenal tool for engaging and interacting with people, but it in, it in and of itself is not the answer to your prospecting needs. Um, emailing, although it was the bottom of our poll results, uh, it still gets read. If you provide value, if you're just spamming people and it's not personalized, it's not targeted towards them, there's no reason for them to open it, right? So again, a phenomenal tool if used correctly. Um, and there is a way, which we'll go through to prospect at scale without spamming or annoying people. And we'll talk about how to do that, uh, how to make your efforts effective, your outreach effective. 
Um, and the last one that, that I want to touch on for just a second is I get told a lot that, hey, my network will keep me alive. It'll keep me fed. Uh, it'll give me the leads I need to make the money to send my kids to college. Um, the network is invaluable, much as the other tools on the list, but in and of itself is not enough either. So now that we've kind of taken on some of those myths, let's kind of rebuild the foundation and talk about, you know, what is, um, you know, what is kind of the core principles of prospecting. People in sales have to understand that their prospecting doesn't have a beginning or an end. It's kind of it's like breathing for sales. It doesn't start when you go into the office at eight o'clock and end if you leave at five or nine to three or whatever your office hours are. You're constantly prospecting because it's about people. It's about connecting to people and constantly being on the lookout for problems that you can solve, problems that you and your solutions are uniquely positioned to solve. It leverages multiple channels, right? There are cocktail parties, networking events. There's industry events. Uh, obviously, we've talked, uh, touched on emailing, phone, uh, uh, social selling, stuff like that. But in order to do it effectively, you have to be prepared, right? And we'll go through kind of how to be uh, best prepared for your prospecting efforts. The other thing I want to do is kind of change your perspective about social selling. First off, social selling is an annoying phrase um, because really, in social environments, especially on you know networks like LinkedIn. Uh, you really shouldn't be selling. You shouldn't be selling your products. You shouldn't be pushing your products and services. It's really about focusing on building a relationship. So if you think of social selling, I, I heard somebody compare it to a cocktail party uh, or a networking event. Uh, it just happens to happen in the digital world, right? You're not going to walk up to somebody at a party and simply say, hey, you want to buy this? Or can I have 15 minutes to tell you about X, Y, and Z? When you know nothing about them, they don't know who you are. And they really have no reason to spend their time, which is the most valuable asset that we have. Uh, with you. And so thinking about social interaction as a way to build a relationship uh, enables us to do it in a much more effective manner. Again, focus on the fact that people buy from people and you want to be authentic and, and a human being that can be approachable. We got a cute little change of terminology here, right? Cold calling, the minute you say cold calling, all, every sales rep I've ever met, you can see the cold sweat break out. Uh, you can see them start to shake in some instances. Uh, so we changed it to goal calling, right? Because essentially what you want to do when you're picking up the phone is you want to have an interaction, but it's based on a goal. It's based on collecting information, perhaps setting a meeting, uh, increasing the familiarity uh, that the person you're targeting has with you. Uh, it becomes a critical component of, of the totality of a cadence when you go after people. The hardest part of prospecting is doing it at scale. And this is where technology becomes our friend. There are a lot of tools, and I will mention quite a few as we go through this presentation, that enable sales reps to do this at scale, but you have to be strategic with it, right? Essentially what we want to do is make sure we're using technology to enable human connection, accelerate that human connection. When we look at prospecting, we talk about something we call a sphere of engagement. Every person out there has these six elements in their day-to-day -day that they can leverage and use, right? And if you look at this graphic, and you'll see the one to X or one to one, uh, it goes around the circle in kind of a heartbeat, right? You go from a one to one connection to a one to many type of connection. It's a heartbeat type of approach. And so if you think about using your network, right, that's usually where people will start the most. And then there's social interaction you know, creating that relationship with people online. Then there's emailing, providing them the content, value, something that's going to catch their attention, uh, as well as, you know, using networking, or excuse me, events. Those could be industry events, networking events, they could be events uh, that your company puts on, uh, but it becomes a powerful tool not only to inform people of what's going on at these events, but also to meet with them or give them a reason to show up at the event. It's a reason to reach out, provide some value and some information. And then there's a concept here at the bottom called groups. And groups is kind of where we look at the sphere of engagement going outside of that day-to-day -day office stuff. When we talk about groups, we talk about things that you do that you're passionate about that you may not necessarily think of as you know, a normal work event. Uh, one of the stories that I tell in classes with clients is uh, I am a uh, Harley aficionado. I have several Harley Davidsons. I go to a lot of rallies. Um, it's not something we're normally going to run into people that want to buy sales enablement <laughs> or, or do sales training. Uh, but we were at Galveston uh, at the Lone Star Rally and uh, through events, which I won't share with this broad of an audience, we ended up meeting uh, basically the CMO uh, of Nationwide uh, Insurance and doing a deal with them at Sturgis, uh, or excuse me, at the Lone Star Rally. It was a 
sequence of events that if I hadn't been paying attention, if I hadn't been looking for those opportunities, never would have presented itself. And so when you think of your sphere of engagement, these are the, the areas that we encourage people to be very aware of and, and engage with purposefully as they go through their prospecting. Um, when you use these multiple facets, when you use this heartbeat cadence approach, right, the goal is to increase familiarity. You want somebody who doesn't know who you are to start to feel like they do know who you are. In order to do that, uh, first, obviously, you have to prepare a target list. Who am I going after? What roles am I trying to uh, capture their attention of? In order to do that, you need to understand their companies and the industries, right? You have to do your homework. Um, you also have another very powerful tool most people have, uh, which is the marketing that your organization does. We refer to that as the sphere of influence. So an organization will put out white papers, uh, news events happen, maybe it's an investment uh, that they get from another company or they acquire another company. Um, it's important to keep an eye on that type of stuff that your company is already doing and understanding that so you can then leverage that in your sphere of engagement. And of course, checking your network. You know, is there a way somebody can make an introduction for you, um, which obviously increases not only familiarity but credibility as well. Once you have your list and once you know who you're going after, once you've checked your network to see if there's any way to get into these accounts, you want to start to engage socially. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail here. Then of course, once you've started to do that, they'll start to see your name. They'll start to, whether they're aware of it or not, it won't be as odd if all of a sudden I've interacted with you socially three or four times, I send you an email and you see my name, it somehow trips the mind. I've seen that where I'm a little bit more familiar with it than the spam I got from a company email address, right? But those emails have to be personalized. And um, we'll talk about that and how best to do that as we go through this. There's a lot of talk when it comes to the phone. First, the first trick with the phone is picking it up. A lot of reps just won't pick it up. Um, but then the question becomes voicemails, when to leave and how to leave. Uh, voicemails. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then this concept of being consistently persistent, right? It doesn't, I think it's 11 no's to get a yes is what I've been told and 21 times to form a habit. Um, this is where I see the vast majority of sales professionals kind of fall down. Uh, it's easy to start it, right? Maybe I do it for a week, then I fall off. And then a couple weeks later, I look at my pipeline, I freak out, I start it again. The key is to be persistent day in and day out prospecting has to be a, a priority for sales reps. The other thing we want to talk about is the fact that it isn't about you, right? And there's a lot of things that you see if you're tracking the content that shows up on LinkedIn. There's a lot of conversations around why organizations aren't able to really uncover the value in the mind of their buyer. Um, they're great and sales reps are great at talking about features and products because it's comfortable. Right? It is a known quantity. It builds confidence because I know when I walk in how to talk about my service, talk about my product. But at the end of the day, especially in prospecting, it's about them. You're trying to provide them value. One of the only ways to do that is to demonstrate that you've done your homework. Right? Every interaction you have with them, whether it be a social engagement, whether it be an email, a phone call, voicemail, you want it to provide value, but that definition of value isn't what you're bringing to the engagement, it is what they consider valuable. And really the only way to uncover that uh, is to do your research, to do your research on them, uh, the companies that they are you know, working at, and the industries in which they play. If you can provide value at every interaction, um, what we have seen statistically is that there's a 3x greater return on efforts uh, that use this type of approach than if you're just focusing on email or you're just sending them, hey, you might think this is interesting, but you really don't know if they'll care about it or not. Taking the time to make sure that you are providing value to them in each of your interactions is going to generate more results, more meetings, uh, more opportunity for you to interact and, and, and of course close more deals. When you personalize things, and we'll talk about personalization when we get to email a little bit, when you personalize things, um, you see a heck of a lot more results in terms of number of meetings, right? 4X from the stats that, that we have. These are stats that are from teams that I've run, SDR teams I've run in the past, as well as from my own experience. This stuff that I'm talking about here, I do every day. I have call blocks that I, I do every day. I make my calls, I send my emails, I personalize my stuff, I do my research. It just has to be part of the everyday life. And if you can do that and focus on them, personalize it, you end up generating greater results. There's a new, everybody likes the new bright, shiny object. The new thing that's kind of on the scene is the concept of putting video in your emails. 
what we've seen from stats there is that if you're sending videos in your email, which are extremely personalized, targeted to the person, demonstrates that you have done your homework, uh, there's 10x more engagement uh, from those types of outreaches than any of the other formats that are out there. And so how do you build that into your prospecting cadence? When do you take the time to record a video? What kind of tools? We'll talk about that as we go through as well. At the heart of prospecting is preparation. If you don't take the time to prepare, then you can't provide anybody value. And what happens if somebody picks up the phone? How are you going to be able to turn that into um, you know, your benefit? Turn it into a situation where you can actually engage with them in a way that answers their problems, right? That, that answers their concerns, that's going to drive you know, metrics and success for them. Preparation from preparing the lists, picking the right targets, picking the right companies, the right industries. Some sales reps may be given verticals. So if, if you're verticalized and you're focused on a vertical, understand that industry, right? But do the homework. Um, I think everybody's probably heard the phrase show up and throw up. Um, it's just not something that is effective anymore today. What we see, everybody's probably heard about the, you know, the buyers are much more informed. There's probably seven people at minimum involved in you know, decision-making processes. Um, at the end of the day, there is no way that you can engage that many people if you're not preparing to understand them as individuals and the way that they work as an organization. Um, so spending the time to do that is key. It is something that um, a lot of reps don't want to do, but it's also, from what I have seen and experienced myself, the most effective way uh, to generate the sales results that you're looking for. So now let's go through that sphere of engagement that we talked about. There are six elements in the sphere of engagement. And typically, if you were thinking, you know, perfect world, rainbows and unicorns, kind of in a linear fashion, how would you go through that? Um, you're typically going to start with your network. Everybody's going to start with, you know, what they know, uh, people that they know, people that they can rely on to introduce them. And then you have something, you have tools out there like LinkedIn or other social networks. And I'd be curious at some point to know how many connections everybody has in their network, right? There happens to be a magic number. It's, it's called the Dunbar number. And what the Dunbar number is, is it's research that shows that human beings can actually not maintain in their head more than 150 connections, 150 uh, friendships, 150 people that they can remember, right? And I don't know about you guys, but my LinkedIn connections, I have, I have a lot more than that. And I go through them and wonder, how did I meet these people, right? So at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, how reliable is your network? And if, there, if you can only really maintain 150 uh, relationships, how are you going to use tools like LinkedIn uh, to scale, right? LinkedIn's a beautiful tool because it keeps them all in one place, right? You can now take notes on your contacts if you're using LinkedIn Navigator and stuff like that. But the network has to be tended and maintained. It's just like friendships in life. Um, people want to know that you're thinking about them. You need to touch base with them every once in a while to understand what's going on. Uh, and so one of the best practices that, that I kind of prescribe for any team that I've run or client I work with is if you look at your LinkedIn network and every Monday or every Wednesday, pick a day, you reach out to 10 to 15 people on your LinkedIn network. You can do it alphabetically, which is kind of how I do it. And you just send them a little email that says, hey, we haven't talked in six months. Um, I have absolutely no agenda other than, you know, spending 15 minutes with you to understand, you know, what you're up to and ways that I might be of service, right? We call it a digital coffee. Uh, I can't take credit for that term. A uh, gentleman that worked for me uh, came up with that term, digital coffee. But being able to reach out on a consistent basis and you just rotate through that whole list throughout the year, right? Go back to consistency. Um, reach out with no agenda. It, it builds your credibility because you're taking that connection seriously. Uh, it also generates some very unusual uh, results in terms of opportunities coming out of places you wouldn't have expected. Uh, the key though is again, approaching them with no agenda. You're not selling anything other than really understanding what they're up to and what challenges they're facing. The other best practice that I would prescribe is do not under any circumstances accept an unsolicited LinkedIn connection. Um, a lot of people will do it to build their network. Some people will tell you that the more people that you're connected to, the more powerful it is. But you have to ask yourself, how many people would actually pick up the phone if you called them if they don't know who you are? Um, so using that digital coffee kind of approach, anytime I get a, an unsolicited connection that I from somebody I haven't met, I, I just respond with, I'm happy to accept your connection, but would love to spend 15 minutes with you to understand you know, a little bit more about what you're up to and ways that I, again, could be of service 
uh, and, and potentially help them out. Uh, it helps you keep that network viable, right, and reliable, uh, which is which is critical uh, as you go through working deals. You never know when you're going to come across an opportunity where somebody in your network may have uh, some connection, some influence. Uh, but in order to be able to rely on that as a part of your prospecting and your total sales process, you have to keep it maintained. Uh, it takes time. It takes consistency, uh, and it's something that you know highly recommend everybody be doing on a regular basis. The network doesn't, you know, I think my wife uses the, the phrase like garden, right? Talks about a garden. The garden doesn't produce the, the vegetables if you're not tending it. Uh, and so in this instance, that professional network is extremely important and something that we need to be paying attention to. Let's talk about social engagement. So you've gone to your network, you're starting your prospecting, uh, you've created a list, you've got some targeted people that you want to go after. Again, when you've you know used your network and nobody's there, social can often be the first time that you come into contact with these people. Um, and so you want to remember that your goal is developing a relationship. You want to understand what they're sharing, why they're sharing it, where they're commenting. Um, you want to really, you know, spend the time to pay attention to them as an individual and see what you can uncover so that when you engage with them, uh, it's meaningful, right? It's purposeful, it's authentic, and it has intent. A lot of people will just kind of scroll through their LinkedIn or other networks and they'll just like a bunch of stuff, okay? Liking is, it's the equivalent of a golf clap. It creates a lot of noise, but nobody knows where the hell it comes from, right? So golf clap is kind of the the lazy way, in my opinion, out of, of engagement, right? It, it puts you in the group, they get notified, uh, but it doesn't have meaning and it's not purposeful, authentic, or, you know, full of intent. So when, when, we, when I talk about engage, um, and I'll, I continue to use LinkedIn as the example because it's kind of the staple for us. I know it differs around the globe, but anytime there's a social network, and when I talk about engagement, I'm talking about taking the time to read what they've put out there. You don't have to read the whole thing. You want to get the main points, but you want to be able to comment, right? You also want to share something in return, right? If they've, if they've spent the time to create the content, especially themselves, uh, there's, some, there's some ego, there's some pride in that. And so you want to recognize that uh, by expanding their thinking, by providing them with something that's valuable, or even engaging in a debate with them, right? Again, to uh, help them understand, you know, kind of a broader perspective. Uh, and if that's something that you can do on a consistent basis, what you end up with are uh, people that you engage with on LinkedIn that you may not be part of your network that you could still rely on and reach out to. But again, it's all based around that concept of increasing familiarity. You haven't called them yet. You haven't sent them an email, but you have socially interacted with them. You have shown them that you have done your homework, that you want to authentically engage with them uh, by your comments, by what you're sharing, so that then when you start in your cadence to call them uh, and you leave them a voicemail, they'll start to recognize the name. So what you will see is an increase in the number of people that will respond to the other facets on the sphere of engagement. That sphere of engagement is designed to specifically give you a force multiplier kind of effect. If you were just doing social, you probably get some responses. I had one client tell me about how they closed a deal on Twitter, um, but that's one deal. One deal, I don't know about you guys, one deal doesn't keep my pipeline full, doesn't hit my quota, and doesn't keep my CEO happy, right? So at the end of the day, uh, it becomes that tool for increasing that engagement, increasing that familiarity so that when you go through the other elements of the sphere of engagement, uh, you increase the opportunity for uh, the kind of connections that you want. The only way it's effective is consistency. Um, I get a lot of uh, I get a lot of flack from some of my coworkers. I got actually just yesterday um, about the fact that I am so active on LinkedIn. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not busy. It doesn't mean I'm not on a plane in some cases. I just understand that if I'm not consistently engaging with my targets, with my prospects, they're going to forget about me. Right? In the digital world, there is no shortage of distractions. Everybody has multiple apps, phones, screens. Uh, I mean, you can watch videos of people running into lamp posts, walking around because they're so stuck to their screens. So things move fast. Memory is short. And so being able to retain some portion of your prospect's attention requires that consistency. Uh, for those of you that have access to it, I highly recommend using LinkedIn Navigator to keep tabs on your targets. Of course, you get the notifications when somebody changes jobs, 
but there is a way in LinkedIn Navigator to take notes on those on those prospects and those contacts. Um, you know, keep track of where you're engaging with them or something you saw them share. And maybe it's not somebody that you're it's current on your current list, but it's somebody that you know will be on a future prospecting list, right? So that news feed, that that engagement on those social networks becomes an extremely powerful way to make people more familiar with you know who you are and the value that you can bring to the interactions. So let's talk about email. Nobody liked email, right? Not surprising. Uh, current best practices um, that I've seen work, you know, emails need to be no more than two to five sentences in length. Uh, it used to be about, I would say end of last year, the trend was uh, kind of talk about them, talk about us. Uh, so we've worked with clients like X, Y, and Z, and we do A, B, and C. Uh, that's turned out now, as things continue to change, not to be as effective. What we've seen from the stats that we collect on the cadences that we run, uh, it's much more effective to just simply open up with, we've worked with customers with these problems. Would love to sit down and talk to you if these are problems that you're having as well. Again, two to five cents is short and sweet based on your homework. Um, and then you can get even more creative as you go through uh, in terms of personalization. Uh, and I want to show you, show you an example here. So this is actually an email, and I believe I took the company name off of it, yeah. This is actually an email that our CEO received. Um, and I am not, under any circumstances, putting this up here as a best practice. I'm putting this up here as an example of what I would consider poor form uh, when it comes to email communication. Um, you know, if you look at it and start to dissect it, you know, this person starts with, I haven't heard back with you, back from you, right, which is an attempt to increase anxiety or induce guilt in the receiver, which is not necessarily the mindset that you want them in, right, and she's trying to get a read on where your head is, right, so when I talk about preparation, when I talk about providing value, um, considering my undergraduate degree was in English, uh, that includes how you present yourself. It includes the, the word choice, the grammar, things like that, right? This isn't about what problems our CEO may be having. Uh, this is all about them. And mobile optimization with a picture of Anchorman, it was a great movie. I mean, there are some awesome one-liners in there. It's not something that I would be doing to build credibility uh, of the serious nature of solving business problems. Um, the other thing I would point out is you have to be very careful um, using vernacular in your, in your emails, right? You, you don't know the background uh, of the people that you're reaching out to. So using words like holler, uh, doesn't necessarily give you the, the credibility that you want. Uh, and this gets confusing at the end. I understand that the person was trying to in, in put some comedy into it, but there are much more effective ways to pull that off, right? It does, again, requires the preparation and the homework. But if you're paying attention to the way people are interacting socially, the way that their businesses are, out, are presenting themselves out there, you understand or should be able to understand what type of tone makes the best, most sense uh, in email. Now, to contrast this, let's look at this email. Um, I don't know how many people out there have heard of the company Snack Nation. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Kevin Dorsey. Uh, I recommend you guys look him up on LinkedIn. He runs their SDR team. And Kevin uh, is very prolific in his sharing of what works and what doesn't uh, from his SDR teams. They run a very similar process to what we're talking about here today with sphere of engagement uh, type of stuff. But one of the things they do is significant customization of email. In this example, the SDR was targeting a dairy company. Um, and what they were doing was attempting to do, and they did successfully, uh, incorporate some of that customization uh, as well as presenting what they could you know, offer to help that customer become one of the top 2% of quote unquote fun companies in America. Your emails are gonna, what, how you tailor your emails are gonna depend on the role you're going after. Right? An executive uh, might find this amusing, might not. You, ha you will only know based on the, on the homework that you do. And being able to customize and be creative at the same time uh, is often more engaging than, than just sending that email that I showed you before. Some might think Anchorman is funny. Some might find it offensive. Right? So you take a very large risk when you go outside of the box that far. I applaud the attempt, but it wasn't effective. It resulted in our CEO sending me the email saying, hey, check this out. We might want to use this as an example of what not to do. Whereas this email here that Kevin Dorsey's team sent resulted in a meeting and a deal for the company Snack Nation. Now, it's, there are a hundred ways to do this. There are a hundred ways to customize it. The big 
challenge for sales execs, uh, depending on the tech stack that they have, is how do you track what's working and what's not? Um, we'll talk about tech stack here in a second. But being able to understand and A-B test your content and your outreach in your email especially uh, is something that I highly recommend that as individual sales reps, everybody keep track of. So let's talk about everybody's favorite part of the sphere of engagement, picking up the phone. Um, cold calling, picking up the phone, whatever you want to call it, um, everybody needs to, I think, first be honest with themselves, right? The number one reason, and I'm not the only one that puts this out there, there are, are many other sales executives, sales leaders who put this out, uh, will tell you that the number one reason sales reps don't pick up the phone is fear. It is uncomfortable to get rejected. Uh, it is uncomfortable to have somebody tell you where to go and, and how to get there, uh, perhaps more colorfully than, than others. Um, but the fact of the matter is the phone is currently the best way to set meetings. Uh, one of the fastest growing technology companies in the sales enablement, sales outreach space is called Outreach.io. Uh, this is a it's a tool that allows and enables sales reps to do cadences. I was talking to their VP of sales uh, earlier this week and asked him point blank how many of their meetings were set were versus phone versus email versus social. 73% of all the meetings they've set in the last 18 months have come from phone calls. So the phone still works. What makes it more effective is that concept of increasing familiarity, right? Social engagement and, and creating cadences that are providing that value. This is an approach that the outreach tool, and there are others like it, Sales Loft is another example. There's a third one called Fileboard, um, differing levels of functionality for those that are interested in the, in the cadence side of it. Uh, but it essentially demonstrates and tracks that, that using the phone is still today the most effective way. Well, we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Uh, the main reason is that because most sales reps don't do it. Right? They just don't pick up the phone. Um, I'm not an advocate of a true cold call, like just calling somebody that, that doesn't doesn't know you, you don't know anything about them, it's kind of like ripping through the phone book for those of us that are old enough to remember phone books. Um, it, it becomes, you know, something that needs to happen, but it needs to be happened in the right way, right? Again, can, focused on them, focused on the, on the research that you've done and providing value at that interaction. Another thing I often see is, is this lack of understanding that uh, a sales rep's physicality actually affects the way they present themselves on the phone, right? Um, Less than 40% of people will remember what you say to them on the phone, but 80% will remember how you say it, right? The confidence that you bring to that interaction. Um, we teach and tell people, you know, the best uh, dialers I've seen, they're, they're standing up, they're moving, they're smiling, they're being confident because your physicality matters. It affects the way that you present yourself. Uh, it affects the tone of your voice. It affects the, the rate at which you speak. Uh, and all of that impression is really what somebody who picks up the phone not expecting the call because it is essentially an interruption. That is really what they key off of. Right now, when somebody picks up the phone and they weren't expecting the call, it kicks in a fight or flight response typically in somebody. I mean, I would assume, and if most of the sales professionals listening today are not doing it, I recommend at least once or twice a week pick up a cold call that you get and see how somebody else is doing it. Very quickly, we'll illustrate what works and what doesn't. But at the end of the day, if you're not projecting the confidence, and that confidence comes from practice, it comes from the preparation, it comes from the research and the homework that you've done, it comes from standing up and being physical, moving, right, feeling comfortable in your own body. If you're not doing that, your chances of converting somebody to a meeting drastically decrease. Um, you'll see a lot of, um, a lot of companies will have bullpens, right? Um, another thing that I highly recommend is cold call with friends. Right? Friends don't let friends cold call alone because you get energy from each other. You want to celebrate the fact that you are picking up the phone right? because nobody wants to do that. So celebrate that you're picking up the phone and celebrate the wins. Celebrate the meetings that are set and collect the objections. Share them. Right? The cold calling is not dead. It, using the phone until, until that technology changes and it's been around a while, um, it's not going to it's not going to go away. So sales reps need to get very comfortable with using it. Again, if you've increased the familiarity throughout the process, um, you will have a great deal of success. And don't be afraid to fail. Um, see, there's a lot of great videos out on YouTube about you know how not to make cold calls. Um, it takes practice. It takes it takes 
you know, confidence building yourself. And the only way to do that is by actually picking up the phone. So we've got six elements in, in our sphere of engagement. And it seems like a lot, right? I, I've had people say, well, that's, how do I scale that when there's so much um, you know, that I have to do? It takes a lot of time. So the first step that I would recommend is look at your technology stack, right? Uh, everybody's got some type of CRM or, or Salesforce automation tool. Called, let's just say Salesforce is an example of that. Um, SFA example would be Pipedrive, right? It's particularly focused on the sales funnel. But there is something that we call, it's called a system of record. And it's basically, this is where all the data goes. This becomes the, the system where every interaction, every opportunity, won, lost, all of that uh, customer, 360 degree, of the Q, 360 degree view of the customer, excuse me, resides. There's also another concept called a system of action. And these are outreach tools. I mentioned three of them, right? Outreach.io, Sales Loft, um, and there's some others out there as well. These are, these are tools that enable the sales reps at scale to prospect effectively. So if we go back to networking and we think your, your mind can really only handle 150 relationships, but LinkedIn kind of extends your memory if you're, if you're consistently tending that network and reach, reaching out to people, these outreach tools uh, do very much the same thing for your prospecting efforts. Um, it allows you to create cadences, which we'll talk about in a second, and test what's working and what's not. Um, so when you look at your tech stack, your tech stack is what's going to enable uh, you to scale. Now, when I say tech stack, that also can mean a notebook. Um, I'm a big proponent of going old school at times, especially for um, being on the phone. Right? When you're on the phone uh, and you're using you know, that as the tool, nothing else should be open. Right? You should be engaged with that phone. There shouldn't be other distractions, um, things like that. In order to do that, I'd literally work off of printed lists of the people that I need to call today. Right? It keeps me focused on the task at hand. It keeps me focused on you know, what I'm trying to accomplish. And it keeps me from, go from looking for the distractions that even I want that give me an opportunity to say, oh, I don't have to make any more calls today. Right? It's not my favorite part of the job either, but it is, uh, it is critical, right? And the technology stack, whether that's digital technology such as Salesforce or outreach or old school tech like a notebook, um, be creating a system where you can track your efforts and, and what's working or not becomes extremely uh, important. When we look at prospecting as a whole, there are really four contributing factors to what is what creates success and what doesn't. The first one, and I can't drive this home enough, if enough is to do your homework. You have to prepare. Um, and that preparation isn't just about doing your homework, just about creating your list. That preparation is also getting comfortable with being on the phone, practicing objection handling. Uh, one of the things that I've had teams do in the past is, you know, sit back to back uh, with another SDR or another sales rep and do a cold call, practice it, role play. I know some people are rolling their eyes right now. Role playing is not anybody's, you know, most fun thing in the world to do. But if you don't practice it, you can't build the confidence. If you don't do the homework, you don't have the information to provide value. So that preparation becomes the, the number one thing uh, that I see a, a lot of sales reps struggle with. Um, other things that we talk about are cadences, right? And, and I mentioned it throughout kind of this presentation and this discussion, and I'll go into it in a little bit more de detail, but creating a, a routine through which you are reaching out and touching these prospects, um, being able to measure those uh, is, is absolutely critical to what's working, and it's a constant evolution. Again, there's no silver bullet, so even creating a cadence that works for the next, say, six weeks, it may not work weeks seven through 12, so you have to be flexible, have to stay on top of what's happening, what's working and what's not. In terms of time management, most sales reps struggle with this in general. Um, so one of the techniques that probably most of you have heard of but is critical is blocking your week, right? Blocking and protecting the times throughout your week where you're gonna dedicate to what we would consider revenue generating activities. Call blocks is the first thing that you see show up on, uh, on blocks, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about, about that. But when you put a block on your calendar for an activity or something that you have to do, you have to protect it. You have to be very diligent and understand, especially call blocks, especially things where you're doing that outreach to prospects, they can't be moved. Right. Um, when you look, if you were to show up at my house and look, uh, look on the refrigerator, uh, I put my put my block schedule up on the on the refrigerator every week, and so my family knows that if it says call block, unless there is bodily harm involved, there's no reason for anybody to disturb that time. 
right? If you're working in an office, uh, we have a client that the signal to the rest of the office is they have their headphones on. So if somebody has their headphones on, you don't, you do not interrupt them because chances are they're in the middle of a, of a call block. So that time blocking becomes one of the best practices that, again, requires consistency and it requires a focus on, uh, but generates significant results. Um, the thing that I can't drive home enough is remove the distractions. Um, I don't know how many windows you know each of you have on your on your uh, computer open at the same time, but between Slack and email, calendar, uh, go to meeting, all of these things show up. You know, social networks show up on your screen, and the minute something changes, everybody wants to look. Everybody wants to see what's going on. Ooh, somebody liked something on LinkedIn. I better go see what that was. Right. We have so many distractions that we have to deal with. The net result is actually seeing our pipeline, our number of qualified opportunities decrease, our pipeline go down, and our quota get missed. Um, so going old school, um, maybe it's against the trend. I don't know since everything's going digital these days. But getting away from the, the computer, uh, if you can, and focusing on what you have to do, removing those distractions, uh, setting up a space that is you know, ready uh, for you to do and focus on, getting in the right mindset, those types of things uh, become critical to the success of not only prospecting, but I would say any aspect of, of sales. So I've mentioned cadences or sequences quite a bit throughout uh, throughout the presentation, and and there are if you run a search uh, in Google, if you Google it, you'll find other people that are putting out, hey, this cadence works really well, or that cadence works. And what we're talking about is understanding and and putting together uh, a. a time-bound uh, approach to how you're going to approach prospects, right? So if you look at, say you have a prospect and you want to get a meeting with them or have a conversation with them, collect information, maybe they're not in the current buying cycle, but you have to engage with them to do that and you don't know them and there's nobody in your network that's going to be able to make the introduction, then what you would do is you run them through what we call a cadence. And that cadence combines social interactions, email outreach, uh, and phone right calling them so again we want to increase that familiarity so in, typically in cadences that I'm running I have like Monday Wednesday Friday I'm going to go out and socially interact with these you know prospect targets uh, the following week I'm gonna send them an email on Tuesday Thursday maybe Friday uh, the third week maybe I'm gonna start my calls maybe I'll call them on Monday socially interact on Tuesday or Wednesday um, you can get as creative as you want with these types of cadences right there are some out there that uh, have very colorful names uh, there is one that I was uh, shared that was shared with me uh, last week called the crazy X uh, and basically it's designed to increase the sense of anxiety in your prospect over about a six-week period of time um, Everybody's going to figure out what works best for them and in terms of creating the cadences, right? Does it make sense to call first because there's already some semblance of familiarity? Do you work for a brand where people will pick up the phone uh, or will pay attention because you drop in a name like Adobe or Google or something like that? Um, so you have to take all of that into account in terms of how you structure them. And once you have, you know, one or two of these set up, then you have to look at the personalization aspects of it, right? So for your social interaction, it's a little bit more free form. You're really trying to get a feel for what they're sharing, what they find valuable, what they're thinking about. But when you move into email and phone, you, you need to take the time to, to, you know, personalize your emails, right? If you're just doing email alone, I think the last stat I saw said it can take anywhere from 11 to 14 emails to get somebody to respond if they do. That's a lot of emails. There's a lot of personalization. If you're just using the phone, it can take anywhere from 9 to 11 dials of a number before somebody will pick up and you have an opportunity to connect. So I go back to individually, if you were just focused on one of those, that's a lot of work for, a, for an individual contact. By using a kind of a layered sequence, we're using that social outreach, increased familiarity, you're using the phone, you're using email to provide value to, to focus on them, you start to see that force multiplier effect that I was talking about. In order to make these cadences happen, you have to block out your week, right? You have to block out each element that you're going to do. And you also want to make sure you're blocking out time to track what's working or what's not. Um, cadences will never be uh, written in stone. 
something again that works this week may not work next week or next month. So being able to track that, being able to track down to, you know, A, B testing your emails. If you're targeting, you know, 10 prospects or say 20 prospects from the same industry, you send 10 of them one email that's written one way, 20, the other 10, another email, see what's generating the best results and be open to the concept that this is a journey and you have to continually kind of evolve to keep up with what's going to, you know, have the greatest effects. When we talk about blocking your week, right, one of the things um, we talk a lot about is call blocks. Everybody, because that is such a fear-based thing, nobody wants to do call blocks. There are other things that need to show up on your weekly, you know, blocking, uh, blocking your week out. Basically 10 things, right? I've talked about all of these, but if you, if you look at a calendar, uh, look at your weekly calendar, uh, I typically do it in Google. Uh, I put these blocks on the calendar. I'm going to prepare my, my list, right? I'm going to figure out who I want to prospect to this week. I also am going to have prospects that are still running through cadences coming from the week before or the week before that. I want to make sure that I've done my company and my industry research, right? That I have some, some understanding of the challenges that they're facing, what they're trying to accomplish. Um, you also want to block out time to practice. Practice the, the cold calls practice, the, the, you know, the objection handling, making sure that you are, like any athlete, trying to get to be the best at your game that you can be. Call blocks are the ones that everybody, you know, shudders at the most, but you need to put those call blocks on the calendar and they need to be, those above all, need to be protected more than anything else. Um, I tell students and clients that you know call blocks are sacrosanct you don't you don't mess with them it requires executive support of that approach as well so your manager is not trying to schedule stuff over it uh, but those call blocks and making sure that you dedicate the time five days a week um, and maybe it's one call block a day maybe it's two depends on your role but making sure you are completely focused during those times uh, just on dialing the phone becomes kind of you know the focus um, you want to set up time to make sure you're customizing your email cadences right so it takes time it doesn't have to take too much but, but you have to make sure you have time set aside for it so you're completely focused on that using again the research that you've done to apply that to the emails to the personalization you want to set aside time to socially interact. This can be, you know, 15 minute chunks or 30 minute chunks throughout the week. Um, everybody, the stats on, on phone usage and screen usage are, are, you know, off the charts. The last thing I saw earlier this week was that 76% of all people in the millennial age range, the first thing they do in the morning is they roll over and they pick up their phone rather than touch their significant other. So we're all on our phones. So you can be doing this while you're waiting in line at the bank, things of that nature, but you also want to make sure that you put the time on your calendar to do that. And then all these activities that you're doing, you have to also be able, you know, to track them. They need to go back in the CRM. They need to go, uh, they need to be there for the business to be able to respond to, for the executives to see, things like that. And you want to also set time, not necessarily weekly, I'd say once a month, to look at, the, you know, the results. What, what worked, you know, in the last three weeks was were people responding more to a certain voicemail script were they responding to a certain type of email what's working what's not working let's make some changes uh, there also needs to be time on your calendar for understanding your sphere of influence this is again the, the stuff that a company does uh, from a marketing standpoint that you can leverage in your sphere of engagement the larger the company the more challenging this can become uh, marketing puts out a lot of, of content, a lot of information. So make sure you're, you're staying on top of what your company is doing or what industry experts are doing and sharing uh, so that you can fuel that engagement becomes uh, important. And I'm also a big self-improvement guy. Uh, I think you need to spend at least an hour a week uh, doing, you know, I think we used to call it staring out the window as a management tactic, right? Just let your mind unwind, think about yourself, focus on something that's going to help you be better, um, you know, go to the gym, whatever that may, may be, but schedule those on your, in your weeks and, and make sure that you adhere to them. Uh, it doesn't take a lot to do it, right? You just, this is a template that we provide sometimes. And again, you'll see the first thing that I provide in all my templates is call blocks because it's the first thing that people don't put on their weekly <laughs> blocks. Um, make sure you put it out there and you, and you share it, right? You know, I said friends don't let friends cold call alone. You, you want to make sure that you've got other friends that are helping support your prospecting efforts, sales professionals, coworkers. Uh, it can be part of your marketing team. doesn't matter, but find somebody, uh, you know, who's going to help you, you know, stay true to that, that type of approach and that type of blocking and understand and respect it and encourage you to stay focused because, again, prospecting is, is the hardest part. It's like leg day at the gym. 
Right? It's critical for your core strength, but nobody likes to do it. Uh, it just happens to be something that is critical for success. Um, and if you ask, you know, in order to kind of back up my points about this, if you ask uh, what we call revenue executives, so anybody, uh, revenue executive is anybody who has responsibility or, um, you know, has a quota inside of an organization, it has to generate revenue. If you ask them what it is that you know, makes them respond. If you ask them, you know, what makes them respond to a cold call? What makes them respond to an email? They are all very consistent, right? These are just three examples from, from some of the interviews that we've done on our podcast. They want it to be about them. They want it to be about their business. And it has to be coming back to bringing value, right? Um, all of these executives have said that they would be glad to pick up the phone. And they do pick up the phone. But what they won't deal with is uh, a, a script or an approach where somebody demonstrates within short order that they don't even remember the name of the person they're calling, right? So that personalization becomes absolutely key, especially with executives, um, because expectations have changed, right? We talked about buyers being more informed and there being more people involved in the decision-making process. But when you look at, especially in the B2B world now, you look at the expectations of people that you're selling to, they have been influenced and driven by the B2C world. So the proliferation of digital experiences, the, the concept of a frictionless experience uh, that we saw in the last 10 years show up in B2C retail type of environments or um, you know, on your phone in apps, uh, these are things that now B2B buyers are expecting. They want to be collaborated with, they want to be taken seriously, and they sure as heck don't want to be sold to. They all will say the same thing, I do not, under any circumstances, want to be sold to. So making sure that you've done your homework, that you've started to increase that familiarity, and you can provide them value at every step, uh, the executives themselves that you're targeting will tell you that it will work, and they will respond, they will respond. So, in summary, the fact of prospecting, you have to use all of the assets at your facets at your disposal. We talk about six and specifically in the sphere of, of engagement, right? And those are the ones that if you focus on uh, and, and do with the right due diligence, the right focus, determination, they do produce the results, but it takes the consistency and it takes the focus. You gotta remember there's no silver bullet. Everybody's gonna keep looking for one, right? I would probably assume in the next 90 days, somebody comes up with another new one to try. Some new technology that comes out. Any new technology that comes out, it may help for a little while, but it isn't going to be a silver bullet that you can count on every time. Using a multifaceted, cadence-based approach, right, with the right focus and consistency is key. It's the only way that you'll start to see the results. And if you're not doing the preparation, you're wasting your time. And more importantly, you're wasting your prospects' time. We talk a lot when we work with clients about respect, right? Respectful persistence and making sure that you have shown them the level of respect and care that you would expect somebody to show you uh, if they were coming after or targeting or marketing to you, right? So that preparation uh, shows that type of respect. It shows that type of interest and it, and it builds your credibility especially with buyers getting more selective about who they choose to engage with based on the experience or the way that it feels to them, the way that they're engaged, this becomes absolutely critical. Each interaction has to provide value. You want to make sure whether it's a social interaction, whether it's an email, uh, phone call, whether you run into somebody at a networking event or you've put together a target list of people you want to make sure you meet at an industry event or a company event, you have to provide value, right? And the value, again, isn't about your value, right? You may be very comfortable with the products and services you sell, but if you walk up to an executive that you haven't met or, or a prospect that you haven't met and you start to tell them about your features and products, how do you know that what you're telling them is really what they care about? How do you know if it's really going to solve a problem that's really top of mind? So focusing on them and focusing on their definition of value and, and putting in the homework to understand it or try to uncover it up front before you've even engaged uh, is, is one of the keys to success. And I can't uh, drive it home enough, consistency is key. This isn't something you can do like the first week of the month and the last week of the month. This is a day in, day out. Uh, block your time, run through the cadences, do your outreach, keep track of it kind of thing. It doesn't happen if you just do it every once in a while. Um, I think it was Jeb Blunt who said, had a stat that said if you don't prospect this week, you won't feel it next week. 
but you'll feel it in 60 days when your pipeline starts to dry up. So there's typically a 45 to 75 day lag between a week of not staying on top of your prospecting and seeing it in your pipeline. And this is, is consistent and I've, I've seen it with my teams that I've run and I've seen it myself. Um, my, even on vacation, vacations are great, but then I'm going to feel it 60 days later because I actually took a break. Right? The only way to scale is to is to do it with cadences and the time blocking and leveraging a tech stack. Right? You, you use your tool set so that you can do more you know, with less. It's kind of a cliche kind of thing. Somebody should probably smack me in the back of the head as an English major for using it, but it's true. Um, if you're not using the tools at your disposal, if you're not putting the focus uh, in on doing this at scale, then it won't happen. And targeting 10 prospects is not going to be an effective way to fill your pipeline. Um, typically, when we work with clients and I myself, I typically have a prospect list of around 200 to 300 individuals, contacts, that I'm running through cadences every 60 days. And I'm building, it builds on itself, right? It starts to cascade effect. Um, but that number is beyond the Dunbar number, which we talked about, right? I can only remember 150. And if it wasn't for the technology, if it wasn't for the cadences and me knowing what I need to do one day, one hour to the next, um, I, I would lose it all. My, my prospecting would go through the floor and my, my quota wouldn't be hit and the boss wouldn't be happy. At the end of the day, we as individuals are the biggest hurdle, right? We're the biggest hurdle in the vast majority of our, of our own lives, but especially in sales and in prospecting. If you don't do it consistently, if you don't stay focused, if you don't get over the fear of picking up the phone and work at it, it's not going to happen. Um, success in sales requires a level of effort that many outside of sales and marketing don't understand. Uh, I used to joke that sales is a, is a 24-7, 365 kind of endeavor. Uh, the first seven-figure deal I signed was was on my honeymoon on a cruise ship in Alaska. Uh, we had the contract faxed to the boat, so or excuse me, ship. Um, it doesn't stop, right? So you have to be willing to be dedicated to it. You have to put in the time. Nobody's going to do it for you. Um, you know, sales is a high risk, high reward type of endeavor. Uh, more work you put in, uh, the more you work on yourself, the more you work on your approaches. Uh, the better you get at this, then the more rewards you will get. The less focus, the less work you do. You know, th there's a reason that they say sales executives have an average tenure of 18 to 24 months, right? So you've got to stay, stay focused. So with that, I will take a breath, thank goodness, take a drink, and see if there are any questions um, that people would like to enter into the questions box. Let me see here. Let me take a quick drink. Okay, so I've got one here that says, uh, I'm an SDR, so for those that don't know, the sales development rep, and I get leads for marketing and I get leads for my SDR, should I still prospect? Why should, why should I still prospect, excuse me? Um, <laughs> to me, that's a, that's a fear-based response, let's say, right? Prospecting is everybody is a sales professional's responsibility and should be doing it no matter what type of role you're in. Um, whether you're an SDR, that's what you're focused on. You're usually prospecting for somebody else. But uh, I don't know how many people uh, would would say that 90% of the leads they get from marketing actually convert to opportunities, right? So if you look at kind of the layers of prospecting that are out there, um, you can have SDRs, you can have marketing providing leads, but those are very rarely providing the quality and volume uh, that are enough to achieve what an individual sales rep may want to achieve. Quote is a nice number, it may be a target, but it should only be a milestone uh, on your way to, to you know, achieving what you want to achieve. Um, we always work with our clients and say, hey, don't, don't worry about your quota, worry about how much you want to make and let's back into that activity level. What is that going to take? So even if I am getting leads from SDRs or I'm getting leads from marketing, um, it is up to the individual to continue to prospect themselves. So my, my advice there would be to, yes, it is your responsibility and yeah, yes, it does mean you have to pick up the phone. Um, so let's see, we've got another one here from Timothy. Hold on a second, I got got to lean closer to see the screen. I'm getting older. All right, so if you're an outside rep, how do you go and visit prospects while keeping cadences intact? So 
this is a bigger question in terms of how do you do a cadence when you travel. So I, I can give you an example. Um, I just came back from a week-long trip to Singapore to train a company's APAC team. So I have most of the vast majority of my clients are North American, right? So now I've got a time zone issue. Um, so I was continuing to do my calls and it blocked it out, was getting up at the right time of day to call, right, and, and do that in advance. If I teach a class on the West Coast uh, in North America, I'll do my calls in the morning before class or right after class. I'll do my follow-up in my email. Um, the easiest answer to that type of question is when you're on the road, um, and I did a lot of, man, I did a lot of traveling. I think one year I had 143,000 air miles domestically in the U.S., so I used to judge the seasons based on the artwork in the Hilton hotels. Um, that gives you a lot of time to be doing work rather than you know sitting in front of a, of a television or down at the bar. Um, so it wasn't unusual to see us kind of attached to our uh, computers or anybody on my team. Not that many people on my team liked traveling with me because that's what I wanted to do was work. But it takes a, a, a kind of diligence and focus. Um, that requires you to be flexible in your timing, right? So if you're focused, if you're working with a client from eight to five, or you've got a big pitch, a big meeting, maybe you maybe you go in at ten, you do a proposal, take somebody to lunch. There's four hours out of your day. The fact of the matter is that if you're blocking your week to begin with, those blocks of time, even doing call blocks every day, uh, still leaves sixty percent, forty, or excuse me, fifty-five to sixty percent of your day free for types of activities like engaging with customers. Um, so it, it, that time blocking enables you to be able to do that, to go see the customers and not let the cadences slip. Um, let's see, got another question here. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour, so I've got one last question here, and it's from Rose. Can I state again the systems of action tools? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. There are three uh, that come to mind that I've mentioned throughout the, the podcast, or excuse me, throughout the webinar. Uh, Outreach.io, uh, SalesLoft, and FileBoard are the three that uh, are the three that I use as examples. There are others, but those are the ones that uh, are the most prevalent. Right? So I want to Thank everybody for being with us today. Uh, the resources from today's webinar will be provided. You can go to the valueselling.com website, uh, resources, webinars to download today's slides. Um, all of this is based off of uh, the stuff that, of course, value selling we enable teams with and teach uh, and train teams on. It, our approach is called Vortex Prospecting. Uh, there's more information uh, on the value selling site for that as well. Also want everybody to save the date for September 14th. We're going to be talking about the value of keeping your customers, uh, why it's easier to sell to an existing customer than acquire a new one. So please save the date for that. Follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, value selling uh, is what you're looking for. And if there's any way that I can be further assistance to anybody, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Easiest way is probably going to be on LinkedIn. Uh, I also host a podcast called the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. Uh, we do interviews with revenue execs on a weekly basis. You can find a link to that from my bio on the uh, value selling site. And with that, I want to thank everybody for taking the time today. I hope you found some value in this. And again, if there's any other questions or any way that I can be of assistance, please don't hesitate to let me know.